Hey, good morning. Um, if you're new, man, I'm Charlie, uh, the lead pastor here, and we are really glad uh, you are worshiping with us, whether it's here in the room or online live or you're watching it later. Really glad. These are very weird times, and I'm really glad that you are finding some time, some way to kind of carve some time out of your week to continue to connect with God and to connect with, with His church in this way. And uh, like Brandy said, we are, uh, we're in a series on the parables, and we've been a few weeks into this, and uh, I'm probably doing it for a few weeks more. Mark and I were talking about it just, just last week, just about, we're just really enjoying this. We may just keep doing it for a while. There's just some great, there's some great stories here, and we learn a lot about God and the way that He interacts with us, and it's, just, it's, it's been really good for me, personally. And um, I'm going to ask a couple of hypothetical questions here that obviously, I mean, they're really more, they're really more rhetorical than anything, I guess. It may, it, it, have you ever felt like that the circumstances that are going on in your life, that are going on in the world around you, or that are going on in the world in general are a little just too much for you to handle? Of course not. Especially not now. This has all been really easy and fun and great and the problems are small and very manageable and you're just tackling everything beautifully and perfectly just like I am because none of you clearly have contemplated the, the, the value of what it would be like if you just dug a hole in the backyard and lived in that. No, just, yeah, because no one, no one would do that. I certainly have not contemplated, uh, done any pro-con lists on that. Um, Man, it's man, it's hard. I mean, it's, can I just go back? I mean, like, let's just pretend that this is March first. I think I could have said all of the same things. I mean, being married is hard. Having one kid, two kid, three kids. Having one who is graduating from college and is really just kind of battling that transition and kind of what does that mean? A, a kid that's starting college. Uh, um, uh, having an eight-year-old trying to manage and lead a church. I mean, again, whatever, whatever your job is, I mean, it's just, it's just all a lot. And then you just think about all the, the challenges that are in the world, what God has called us to as his people. I mean, we talk about this. I mean, it's, 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 it's on the mission statement, and we've, I've talked about this before. Where it says that God's calling us to change the world, and that feels overwhelming. I say, you know, that God wants to, to use you to make a difference in the world. And it's like, well, how, how can I make a difference when everything is, is so broken? And that was March 1st. We could have said all of those same things. And a lot of things have happened since March the 1st. And it just feels like um, I just, we, we, we just, we just can't. And we don't know what to do. And again, I may be, at this point, I may be speaking a lot about me, where I just say, when, when I get overwhelmed, when the problems seem too big, when it all seems too much, I do, I, I tend to hide. I tend to think, well, I mean, it just, it just, it just doesn't matter anyway. Other people may, if, if things get too much, they're just going to work themselves to exhaustion, thinking they have to keep going until the problem is solved. And when the problems are so big and overwhelming, um, you just can't. And all you're doing is wearing yourselves out. And meanwhile, we, we find ourselves completely stressed and completely exhausted, and we don't exactly know why. But I think, um, I think some of these parables we've looked at over the last few weeks have helped, and I hope that this one will too, because there is this sense in which we've got to strike a balance between the problems... Um, are so overwhelming that I might as well give up, and feeling this overwhelming pressure that all of the world's weight and all of, all of the problems I see, all of that weight falls on me. And so Jesus is talking to his followers here in Matthew chapter, in Matthew chapter 25. He's talking to them here essentially about what he expects and wants from them for their lives. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read this passage, and then we're going to answer a few questions that kind of can help us understand it a little bit better, and then kind of drill in on what the big point is. And this is referred to um, as the parable of the talents, even though the translation we're using is not going to use that word specifically. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. Again, 
It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. That's me. That's what, that's what I just said. That's how I, that's like, I like this guy. He just, it's all too much. I'm just going to dig a hole in the backyard and just be fine. He's a great guy. Good, awesome. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a lot there, a little bit overwhelming, maybe even a little bit stressful. And, and if we're honest, there's a lot of things in there that seem to kind of go against maybe even some of the parables we've talked about over the last few weeks, and certainly a lot of what are our perspective about, about what God is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, and like I mentioned, this is called the parable of the talents. And it's just kind of s- simplified it for us a little bit by, by calling, instead of using the word talent, talking about a bag of gold. And we did another, um, uh, we've, we've, we did another series, uh, another, another sermon in this series a few weeks ago where this, this master had loaned essentially this guy, you know, 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold. And so um, if you grew up, like I did, understanding and hearing the translation where it just kind of used the word that, that's there, which is talent, you might ask this question, which is important. Again, it's already partially been answered for us here. Like, what is a talent? When it says that, you know, he gave him five talents, two talents, and we use this word is a lot in the New Testament, again, depending on what your translation is. And again, bag of gold is simple enough, but essentially a talent, a talent of gold, it's a weight. And essentially at this time, um, it was kind of essentially about 130 pounds. So 130 pounds of gold. And essentially, I mean, this is, this is a lot of wealth. And so for, for, this, for this guy to have given his servants five of these giant, I mean, really heavy bags of gold, or two bags, or even one bag, um, I mean, that's a significant amount of wealth. Essentially, um, uh, this, this, amount, this amount of gold back then would be about what someone would earn and. 20, 30 years of, of working. And so you, know, you got a guy that's with, 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 um, with two talents. Now we're talking about 40 to 60. With five, we're talking about well over 100. 100 years of what you would earn, and this is what he entrusts to them. And so what this guy does, what this king does, is like this, this, he goes, like, I'm going to go on a journey, and I'm going to leave my wealth with you. I've got some things that I need to do, and I'm going to entrust what is mine to you? And so he, he divvies out amongst these three servants based on his perception of them and what they think that they can handle. He's like, oh, I'm going to give you this much, I'm going to give you this much, and I'm going to give you this much. And, and the expectation there being is that eventually he is going to come back and expect something in return. And so we see this uh, evaluation where they're kind of, they're working, this guy... The, the guy with five, he doubles his. The guy with two, he doubles his. And the one, again, he, he buries it in a hole. 
And then the king comes back and settles accounts. And obviously he, he brings praise to the guy who, the, to the two that, did, that worked hard and brought the master more wealth. And he brought condemnation to the guy who essentially didn't do anything with it. And, um, and so the big question that we need to make sure that we understand if we're going to try to apply this at all is what does a talent represent? I mean, we, okay, it's a bag of gold. It's a big bag of gold. It's the kind of bag you really couldn't carry. You would need an ox and a cart or whatever to haul this much gold around. What does it represent? And this is the interesting thing about the word talent, which has nothing really to do with our word talent, which is you know, skills, things that you're good at. But because the word was so similar, this was essentially what they told us in, in Sunday school growing up, that that's what this is. It's your talent. So God's given you talents just like he gave them talents, which is very confusing and really bad Bible study methods. Just because you have a word that is the same as that, it doesn't mean the same. You cannot substitute those things. But it's not particularly... He, Jesus doesn't make it 100% clear. He doesn't completely explain it, but I, I think that if, if you analyze what he's talking about here, it's like that this, the, this master has given them something and is going to come back for a, after a long time and to see what you've done with it. I think the clearest, best understanding of what he's talking about here is what a talent represents is all of it, all everything, all of you, everything that you are, Everything that you have, all the experiences that you have, all the opportunities have, all the wealth that you have, the talent you have, the friendships you have, everything, everything about you. This is essentially, he is talking about your life. God has given you your life. He has given you however many years that is and all sorts of opportunities, all sorts of resources, both physical resources, internal resources, relational resources. He has given you a lot. And there is an expectation that what God has given you, you are going to have to give an account for at some point when the master returns. And so the bags of gold that you have been given, you are the bags of gold. And every opportunity that you have, every, um, every interaction, every gift that he's given you, every talent that he has given you, all the, uh, all the resources, whatever it is, all of those things that you have, God has given to you. And according to this passage, according to this parable of Jesus, there is going to come a point in which there is going to be some accountability, a reckoning of sorts for what you did with what God has given you. And so, again, to to make sure that we clearly understand all this and that we're putting in the right context, I actually do still have a couple of more questions that I think it's important for us to answer. And one of these is we we, we have already addressed over the last couple of weeks, but because we don't really get it and we don't understand it and you didn't believe me when I said it the first time, we're going to talk about it again, which is this... Why was the master unfair? Why was he not fair? Why was he not fair? I mean, because it seems like this is not, he had apparently eight bags of gold. I mean, eight is not divisible by three easily, but you could take some of the, you, know, you can still divide it out evenly if you wanted to, right? Which is what? What was that? Right, right? Two and two-thirds, right? Of course, you all knew that, right? I'm going to give it out to these three. Or they, I, I'm going to give out the, the equal amount, But that's not what he does. He gives this one guy five, this one guy two, this one guy one. Based on what? This is based on their abilities. He had a perception, the um, the master did, of what these guys could handle. And so you really couldn't handle much more than this, so I'm going to give you this. You can handle more, I'm going to give you that. And so he gives them based on his perception of their abilities, which is according to our definition that we talked about last week, is horribly unfair, which we defined fair. We talked about fair and just. Just is that, you, that God treats you or you get exactly what you deserve. Fair is everybody gets the same thing. And we said this last week. I'll say it again. God has never said that he would be fair. He said he would be just, and when he's not just, it's to your advantage. But he never said that he would be fair. 
And it actually makes sense what this master does. Like, this guy can't handle more than this. I'm going to give him what he can handle. That's actually pretty reasonable. But if you take it back a step and you think, but hold up. If we're talking about my life and what I can do and what kind of I can accomplish, well, God created that. The master did not create these servants. He got these servants, and these servants can handle whatever. But God created me. God created all of us. And it is clear then, if he's talking about our lives, and he gives us different amounts of talents, bags of gold, responsibilities... Uh, good things or whatever, if he gives them based on um, what he thinks we can handle, and he's the one that created us, then he created all of us unfairly. Right? He has created some of us with a larger capacity and, and seemingly more blessings and more resources, be they, again, talent resources, Charisma, relational capacity, uh, financial and physical resources. There are people who have more than others. And I'm telling you, the more and more I talk to people, the more I realize that there are a lot of people that just cannot get over that. And you're just going to be stuck there forever. You're just going to be stuck in this place where I'm going to live my life constantly believing and thinking about how unfair it is that I'm here and there are other people here. We very rarely give any attention to the fact of how horribly unfair it is that we have these many resources and there are people in the world that only have this. We will give very little attention to that. We are giving some attention to it now over the last couple of weeks at least in one particular area. But there are dozens of such areas where we, don't, we rarely look down. We look up, and I get stuck here because I'm so mad at all of these people. This is the unfairness gap, right? But what is this gap? This is the I'm awesome gap, right? Right? Let's be honest. You don't have to be honest. We're in church. It's kind of dark in here, and you guys are online. You don't have to be honest. You can just sit there and just say nothing. This is the unfairness gap. God's not fair gap. And this is the I'm great gap. Or this doesn't even really exist because I don't, I don't think about it. And I decided this this week that I think uh, the hero of this story is the two-talent guy. I mean, the five-talent guy. I mean, he's, I mean, he's like, he had a lot. He's obviously a high-capacity guy who has a lot going for him. And so... The master gives him a lot. He does exactly what you think it was. But the two-talent guy, he didn't get stuck on that somebody got more. And in fact, you know, they, they, they essentially did the same thing. Again, if you're a mathematician, which I am, right? They took what they had and they doubled it, which is the same. It's the same. And so then when this guy, he buried his in a hole and gave it back and the guy got mad, who'd he give it to? He gave it to this guy. Why not this guy? This guy got 10. I just got four, and I worked just as hard as this guy. Give me one, be five. I'll still be, still only be half. And this dude, he just, he just does what he's supposed to do. Not allowing himself to be tripped up and frustrated by the fact that somebody seems to have more than them. Because he could have spent however many months or years it was that the master was gone frustrated and resentful about the fact that this guy, the, the master, gave him more. Well, he gave him more. That means he likes him more. It means he thinks he's better than me. It means he doesn't really like me. And the next thing you know, he even, he didn't even dig a hole. He just sat there and stared angrily at two bags of gold. But that's not what he did. And I think it's important for us to recognize that this world, there's going to be different outcomes. People are born into more fortunate circumstances. And um, some people are born into less fortunate circumstances. Some people are just born with seemingly what appears to us to be greater and better gifts. And we need to stop. We need, we need, we need to, I, I, I just want to say 
that, that I think it's, it's, it's time for us, it's time for us to, just to stop looking this way. Now, there's lots of great opportunities for us to look down. But really, the, the point of this is not about what somebody else has, which seems like they have more, or what somebody else has, what they seem less. It's about what are you going to do with what God has given you? Last question before we kind of get to the big picture idea, which obviously we've been building towards for some time, which is this. Wait, I thought life with God was free. If you hang out here with me long enough, you'll hear me say this once, twice, 10, 20, 50, 100 times, that salvation and the gift of God through Jesus Christ and the gospel is 100% free. You are not earning it. You do nothing about Jesus' death on the cross, which allows you to be forgiven from your sin and to experience life with God. That is 100% free. There's nothing that you did on the front end to earn it. And we talked about this with the, with the, with the parable of the vineyard. When these people, you're not working it off on the back end. God did not give you salvation for free and then say, well, now I've given you this huge gift for free. Now you have to work for the next 50 years to pay me back. That is, that is what we say. That is what we believe. And that is absolutely, and, and nothing in this passage contradicts this. There are two principles that exist in the scriptures and they exist side by side. And if we, can, if we can get to the point to where I understand both of these things together, I understand how they work together in my life, I understand that they both be true, it's not either or, it's both, the clearer I will be on who God is, who I am, and what my responsibilities are. The, the gift of salvation is completely 100% free. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says... That, the, that, that, the, that, that it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that you can't brag about it. It is 100% free. But 1 Corinthians 3 says something, uh, says something different. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, now again, not contradictory, it's just saying something different. What it's saying is, is that you are living a life and the life that you are building has consequences. And the things that you are dedicating your life to, Paul describes it like you're building a house. You are building a house with your life. And what you choose to do with your time and your resources and the gifts and things that God has given you, you are building a house. And ultimately he says that that house will be put to a test. It will be passed through a fire. So there's going to be this moment after, after you die where everything that you've built in your life is going to be like a house that is put to a fire. And the stuff that doesn't matter is going to be completely burned away. And the stuff that does matter will pass that test and will essentially be giving you, given to you like a reward. But the things that you did that don't matter will be burnt away. And it says that you're going to experience loss. And again, Paul says this beautifully, if not... Mm, I, beautifully is not the right word. It hurts when he says it. But it's really, it's really good the way that he says it. He says that the person will experience loss, but they themselves will be saved, but like one passing through a fire. So again, fire metaphors being having the idea of what hell is like. He's like, you're going to be saved... You're not going to go to hell, but you're going to, you're going to experience loss and like one who has walked through a fire, which is a really interesting, if a very powerful metaphor. You're not going to go to hell, but a little bit you're going to smell like it. That is one of the most sobering passages in all of Scripture. And this is essentially what Jesus is saying here in the parable of the talents. That what you do with what God has given you, it matters. And we'll say it this way, and this is the big picture point. What you do with your life, it matters. And it just, it matters. 
What you do with your life matters. We say, when people say it's like, oh man, if salvation is free, then you can, make, you can do whatever you want. I'm like, what a dumb thing to say. That God has given you this enormous gift, which is eternal life, and, that, and, and your response to that is, oh, it's free, so I can do whatever I want. Like, what, what, who thinks like that? We do, but you shouldn't. And God has given you so much more than that. And he has said to you, these are things that I am trust in entrusting to you. And I'm going to go away, but then I'm going to come back and I expect to see a return on the things that I've given you. And, and, and according to this passage, this parable, and it matters one way or the other. And according to the passage in 1 Corinthians 3, it, it matters. You think, well, heaven's going to be heaven anyway. Well, sure, heaven's going to be heaven anyway, but like, do you really want? Is that really what you want? It's like, eh, it's, I mean, it's still going to be great. So what? My clothes are a little bit burned and I smell a little bit like fire. At least I'll be able to say that I made it. Like this God that loves us and has given us everything and we finally get to meet him face to face. And my response to him is to say, well, I know I didn't do much with what you gave me, but at least I made it here, right? High five. Or do you want the God of the universe who has loved you and gave his son for you and you have worshipped and followed for your whole life, do you want him to look into your eye and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. It it matters. And just because theologically we understand that we're not talking about, this passage is not talking about losing salvation, you're, you're losing something. And you're missing out on an incredible opportunity to look back at, the, at, at all of your life and say, my life, it mattered. And, 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 and to be able to look at the joy and the pleasure of my God's face, to be able to say, you did good, man. I'm so proud of you. C- come on in. And I think it's important for us To understand that this matters. It matters to me. It matters to God. And it matters to the other people that you take what you have and you invest it in them. And you may think, man, I don't don't have that much money. But do you have enough to just bring a little extra food with you next week and put it in the pantry and help feed one family one meal this week? I promise you, whatever you bring will be gone within 24 hours. There are people there all the time. I don't have much, but I can help feed one family one meal this week. I really don't know that many people. I really can't talk to that many people about Jesus. I only know, I don't really, I have that many relationships. Okay, do you know one person? Do you have the ability, do you have a platform where you could tell one person a little bit about the hope that you have? I'm not very, I'm not very, I'm not very good with, talking to people I don't really know if I really that's in my bag of gold can you pray can you can you can you try to move the heart of God for those people that are around you there are always things that you can do and God has given you these things and it does not matter how small they are it does not matter how they compare to anybody else God has given you opportunities with other people. He has given you physical resources. He has given you gifts and talents that he wants you to use to make a difference in this world. Can we just talk about the one talent guy again for just one second? Digging his hole. I said at the very beginning that we're talking about a 130 pound bag of gold. If I just said, hey, it's a little bag of gold, like one of the little things like you see in a cartoon with a little dollar sign on it, you kind of hold it like this, and you say, I dug a hole for that, that wouldn't take very long, maybe, you know, just a few minutes. You dig it. If I said, I'm going to hand you a 130-pound bag of gold, and you got to dig a hole, put that in there and bury it, that took a lot of work. I mean, 
calls him lazy. He's like, not, not lazy. I mean, he, he, can work, he can work really hard. That's a, that's a big hole. A big hole he had to dig. It was a whole lot of work for him to not do what he was called to do. Let's take that energy, all this energy that we're burning with all of the excuses about why we're not taking what God has given us and making a difference in this world. Let's take all that energy and let's just just take that. Let's just take that and say, I'm going to try to have one conversation this week with somebody who is struggling to try to encourage them. I'm going to try to have one conversation with somebody this week whose perspective about God is off, that's struggling in their sin, that need the hope of Jesus. And I'm just going to talk to them. I'm just going to take a little bit more of the financial resources that God has given me, and I'm going to give them to our church. Or I'm going to give them to people who need it. I'm going to support a missionary. I'm just going to take a little bit of what I have. I'm going to spend some time thinking about what are, what all is in my bag of gold, and I'm going to ask God, what would you like for me to do with that? And then I'm going to take this week, and I'm going to do those things. And you may think, man, still, even at the end of the day, all I've done is that one little thing and the problems are so big. But yeah, we're not, but you're not just one person. We are a lot of people. And God's people all around the world are even more. And if we all took the attitude that said, I'm going to take what God has given me and I'm going to invest it in people and issues that matter if we all did that a billion people doing that makes a huge impact on the world immediately but I can't be in control of that all I'm in control of right now is what I do with what God has given me and I'm going to leave here stop thinking about what other people are doing or what they're not doing I'm going to stop thinking about what people have that I don't have And I'm going to be faithful with what God has given me because what I do with my life, it matters. Let me pray. 